Riverside Country Park, located alongside the River Medway, is a scenic coastal spot scattered with rustic boats and is a good place for bird watching. In addition, the area has a very interesting historical background dating back to the Industrial Revolution. The first Portland cement factory appeared on the River Medway in 1851, with the secret ingredient for this new cement being Medway mud. The coastline of Gillingham has had a rich and varied past. The Riverside Country Park was established in the 1970s by Medway Council and takes in the various areas of Motney Hill, Rainham Dock, Bloor's Wolf, Horrid Hill, Sharps Green Bay and East Court Meadows. Good evening everyone. As you can see I'm joined by the very lovely Candice. We're in Kent again tonight and it's a very warm summer's evening here. I've just left work, picked Candice up, we've headed down here. We're at the Riverside Country Park, just near Gillingham. Uh, so on the, the southern bank of the River Medway estuary. So we've got our Van Gogh Nevis two-man tent, or two-person tent, should I say, to be politically correct in today's climate. We've got some ciders with us as usual and some grub and it's about eight o'clock now so the sun's still out there's a few people still milling about as well dog walkers and stuff so um, we're walking along this like little peninsula of land uh, called Horrid Hill I'm going to tell you a little bit about the reason for that name later on in the video and yeah, we're walking along that and it's like a, a peninsula that juts out into the into the river itself. Looks like the tide's in at the moment. The causeway in front of us leads out to Horrid Hill, which was constructed just over a hundred years ago. It is said that the name comes from the hanging of convicts who had attempted to make their way to this island from the prison hulks anchored in the estuary. The hangings were designed to act as a warning and deter other convicts from trying to escape. Horrid Hill also marks the end of Sharps Green and was reputedly popular with smugglers in the past, taking advantage of easy access to the many boats carrying their wares up and down the river. Sharps Green itself was part of a small but busy cement works. A horse-drawn railway was used to take its loads up and down the causeway to Horrid Hill. to our potential uh, wild camping spot for tonight, right on the edge of the peninsula here at Horrid Hill, at the country park on the peninsula. Candice won't be on camera at the moment because she's having a fat ugly moment. So uh, yeah, her loss because I've just cracked open a cider. Another fat just rosé. We both love this cider. Mm. Cheers. Ooh. Like my head's up really big like it's come up. <laughs> Got Tom's favourite. Tuna. Lemon and pepper. Uh you're on your Tom, own with that. Tom loves it secretly. Stuffed his face when he goes home with it. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, get your laughing gear around that. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> keep that away from me. What? I can smell that. It's really nice. I was just going to say, is it nice? Mm. Yeah, good. This is 50p Morrison's. Bargain. Deal. Oh, yeah. Thank you for watching. <laughs> <laughs> That's Candice's first bit of uh, video in by herself, by the way, everyone. So, uh, get in the comments, say well done, all right? Well done, you. Enjoy. Bye.
quarter past nine now. The temperature's dropped ever so slightly, so I've cracked out my hoodie. Um, we've basically got the place to ourselves, apart from this one guy that's on his own fishing, just literally over there on kind of the, the sea wall, the river wall as it were. Um, he's alright, he doesn't seem to care us being here. So we'll wait for him to go because he's not got sleeping gear by the looks of things, he's just here to fish. Um, we'll wait for him to go and we'll sort of just keep an eye out because we did see like a guy that was like a warden that was keeping an eye on I think the car parks, he was waiting for everyone to clear out the car park so we could lock the gates. We've parked the car outside of the, the car parks, outside the gates on a little lay-by so it shouldn't be a problem but he did see us walking down there with like rucksacks and stuff and don't think it's going to be an issue. So He would have been here by now. He would have been here by now as Candice says, yeah. And we know that the gates open at 8am so but the thing is, is there's still like, like um, pedestrian access, you know, you can still walk down there, there's like little styles that you can go through and stuff, so they must expect people walk down here late at night after the car parks have closed, so can't see why they're going to stop us, so, but we'll keep our eyes peeled anyway. It's nice though, as Candy says, this is what it's all about, it's lovely views, lovely weather. The, uh, the peninsula here has come alive <laughs> as you can see in the background I think four or five youngish sort of lads have turned up teenagers I'd say have turned up to night fish and they've even bought a pop-up tent so I think they're gonna be night fishing here but I think we should still try and camp here because we spoke to the fisherman earlier that we saw that was on his own He's gone round the other side of the peninsula to see what he can catch there. He's not camping. Um, and he seemed fine. He went, oh, what are you up to? And I went, oh, we're going to try and camp. And he went, yeah, why not? He went, you're not doing any harm, are you? So hopefully this lot aren't going to be too much of a problem. But we might try and have a look sort of around the other side of the peninsula, just away from them. Yeah, so we'll have a look and we'll get back to you if we've got another spot. It's 11 p.m. now. We had a bit of a disaster right up at the peninsula um, at Horrid Hill, where the those kids turned up. We uh, we found a little spot just round the corner from them on the other side of of the headland. Uh, yeah, couldn't peg in. It was all like bricks and you know rocks and concrete and stuff underneath the you know the soil you could get the pegs in about halfway and they just weren't holding I bent and snapped a few pegs and stuff and we was going to go back to the car which is not that far away and get the hooped bivvies and just throw them down the floor but we both wanted to use the two man tent really tonight and then suddenly we was walking back along the path and there's a little bit that comes off of it down to this little river beach it's in a little bit of a, the wind really and we've managed to peg the tent out, the Van Gogh Nevis 200, uh, with my new sand stakes. I've had to hammer them in with a rock still, so it's burred the edges a little bit, but what can you do? It's not the best pitch, I'm not going to lie, it's a bit saggy, but it's working, it's holding all right. So Candice is just starting to put all the mats and stuff in the tent now. It was an absolute git setting that up. Now. Here's the tide line, the highest tide line. Here's the tent. Now, we've seen the tide coming in all evening, so I think it's probably going to start going out, which means it didn't come this far up. I didn't see it come this far up. So, I think this is like the real high tide that you get in like storms and stuff like that. I think it's going to stay further out there. I think we'll be fine here. I'm going to keep an eye on it, 
you can't see on the camera that it's just too dark but I can see it with a naked eye and it's we should be alright honestly just take my word on it but I know I know some arse I will get in the comments and go oh you should have done that and stuff and they probably never get out and camp themselves and have very sad lives so you know haters are gonna hate anyway but this is what we're doing so yeah swivel on it <laughs> so yeah we get set up I'm absolutely starving okay we're sat on the foreshore just in front of the tent we've got just our little sit mats tonight and for dinner I have got beans and burgers that's just finished boiling and then I've got a galaxy hot chocolate and a Nescafe a mocha uh, dessert dessert's gonna be a good one. Oh, yeah sorry as well I've got some uh, some crackers from a USMRE uh, I think Hardy might have given me those out of one of his ration packs so cheers mate dessert oh dessert I've got another of my favorites sticky toffee pudding so this one was a uh, recently given to me by my mate Rob aka Iron Wok uh, at the start of the pedder's way and I kept it because I didn't want to weigh myself down and uh, yeah so it's a, a, a Crossman's sparkling Somerset cider medium dry 5.5% I think he got this when he went to a beer and cider festival in the Mendips something like that I think so it's produced traditionally in Somerset it's made by Ben Crossman, Mayfield Farm, Hewish. It's even got the postcode there. We go and visit him. And the telephone number. So it's obviously like a, a small um, sort of batch, you know, sort of a small company making them. And, uh, yeah, we've had a bit already. Candice accidentally knocked some of it over. It looks like piss. It looks like piss. It's got a bug in it as well now. But anyway, yeah, I don't mind it. So, uh, yeah, cheers, mate. It's uh, going down rather nicely. Uh, I'm guessing you're going to want me to give it a rating out of uh, out of ten. I'd say six and a half or seven. I always give them seven out of ten. Six and a half. So it's just above average. It's good. It's good. It's it's not horrible. Don't know what that bug's going to be like now. But yeah. Anyways, so cheers to a good camp. Eventually, we found a good spot. You know, good things come to those who wait. Right. I am absolutely starving. I'm going to get eating that now. Okay, it's getting on to about midnight now and I'm just about to have my uh, sticky toffee pudding and I've got another hot drink. It's not really cold, I mean it's, no. there's a slight breeze coming off the off the medway but it's it's really nice. Um, yeah, so I've got another another tea but the the main highlight one of the main highlights of the camp out sheet is going to be this. This is our final cider. Candice picked this up for me because I saw it in a pub the other day and I couldn't have any more because I was driving. <laughs> so I was like, let's be sensible, you know. And uh, yeah, Brothers Strawberries and Cream. I tried the Palmer Violets one the other day and that's on my Instagram. I didn't really like it, I'm afraid. So the people that recommended it, cheers, but weren't quite for me anyway this one could be different it's a big bottle this time so it's a full pint 500 mil four percent uh strawberries and cream english cider made by four brothers in somerset our family of unconventional thinkers make fruit cider an experience to savor a combination of sweet fruity strawberry flavors with creamy vanilla tones trailblazers of fruit cider let's crack this bad boy open there we go oh that smells really nice oh oh that's all right that is that's actually quite good <laughs> Wow, the, the the creamy vanilla taste is amazing in it. Yeah, I probably couldn't drink a lot of them because they're really sickly, I think, but that is really good. If I had that over ice, I say the same thing all the time, I know, but if I had that over ice, that would be amazing. 
Try a bit of that, go on. That's really good. That's good, that is. It's good, yeah? <laughs> you can taste the vanilla. Yeah, that's the best bit about it. The strawberries is good, but... The like, strawberries can be really sweet. Yeah. Because normally you get like strawberry and lime, and that's, that's okay, but the strawberry overpowers it normally. That, they sit well together. What would you give that out of 10? Eight. You'd give it eight out of 10. I think I'd give it an eight and a half. It's not worthy of being a nine, but it definitely gets an eight and a half. That is a, that's a, a, a winning cider. I would say out of all the brothers ciders they do, that might be my favorite one. I like the toffee apple one as well, but this, this is, this is amazing. Eight and a half out of 10, eight out of 10. It's a winner in our books, cheers. Okay, it's about 1am now, uh, it's a bit later than normal, mainly just because, you know, we had to uh, move spots and stuff, and by the time we set up and then actually sat down to eat and stuff, it was getting quite late, so we're both pretty tired now, but we've had a good time, it's, we've actually probably found probably the better spot, we're going to aim to get up for around 7am, yeah, until the morning, we'll say goodnight. See you in the morning, everyone. Good night. Good night. breakfast this morning I've got this chocolate muesli dehydrated meal by Decathlon uh, they're a little bit cheaper than their like main meals got a gusset bottom as well this one requires uh, let's see a hundred mil of water apparently so the last one I had of these the pasta bolognese was, was really tasty so I've not seen these ones before, so I'm going to try this out. I've got a hot chocolate and a coffee. I've had one of Candice's little lemon drizzle, uh, sort of healthy bars. Yeah, I feel a bit more awake now. I think it's about half seven. The kids that were fishing um, up further up there at the edge of the peninsula, they've, they've long gone apparently, so we're also quite tucked out of the way here. Apparently no one's seen us. Candice was chained to some old fella as she usually does. <laughs> and uh, he didn't know we'd camped or something. She told him and he was like, oh really, that's that's pretty cool. And couldn't see where we'd camped. So obviously we're, we're fairly, fairly well tucked away here, which is good. Anyways, right, let's crack this open. Let's have a look at it in its dry format. So... A lot of chocolate powder in it. Okay, let's add some water to it and get it rehydrated. Okay, it's rehydrated and it looks very, very chocolatey indeed. This is uh, the outcome of it. Let's give this a try. Yeah, it's alright. Very runny, I mean, I definitely put 100ml in. And it's not overly sweet as well. Yeah, I could sit and eat that. That's not bad. Well done, Decathlon again. Their meals are pretty good. They're made by the French, though, so... 
you know, French do decent ration packs, so they must do decent food. But it's French. So these, by the way, are the the new sand and snow steaks that I've got. I can't remember who makes them, but I had to order them in from like China or some place. But yeah, my mate Hardy, Hardy Aaron Tempest, uses these on his Helm 110. And they're really, really good. Very lightweight, incredibly light. Like they're big. I mean, you, you, you could dig a cat hole through a shit with these. Um, but, you know, they, they hold really well. So, yeah, just thought I'd show you them. As per usual, we're leaving absolutely no trace. Horrid Hill, part of the park, was originally an island and it was later joined to the mainland by a causeway in order to allow a horse-drawn railway to reach the cement works. From mid 18th to 19th century, there were two types of hulks in the Medway, those used for criminals and those used for prisoners of war. This links in to one of the many rumours as to why it is named the Horrid Hill. It is thought that convicts housed on these hulks in the Medway, anchored close to Chatham, made an attempt to escape to the land which looked like an island. Those who were recaptured were hanged as a warning to others, giving it the name. Other rumours about the origin of the name are that during the Napoleonic War, French prison hulks were moored off Horrid Hill and local people could recall hearing the screams of the prisoners and the horrid conditions that they faced. A less gruesome rumour is that the name came from the manure used on the local farms which was dumped at the base of Horrid Hill, creating an unpleasant smell. Throughout the 1850s, the River Medway was supplying the whole world with Portland cement before similar mud was found elsewhere to produce it. Many Medway industries were based on large amounts of local materials and consequently became harder as well as more expensive to find as the materials were used up. During this period of time, the workers who dug from the estuary were called muddies. At high tide, barges would sail from Raynham docks into Medway, where the muddies then had the job of climbing over and shoveling slime and mud into the barge until they floated off to be unloaded after the tide came in again. Great amounts of mud were dug from the river this way, therefore meaning there are now deep pits filled with soft mud at the bottom of the river. It was initially feared that the mud extradition might change the flow of water in the river, which would cause silting. In the 1860s, Alfred Castle used to moor his vessels in Sharps Green Bay to collect chalk from a nearby quarry in Twiddle, before heading across the water to his two cement works on Coimbra on the Isle of Sheppey. The chalk was carted to the barges from the quarry, then the barges would be loaded at low tide, as the draught of the vessel would require more water under the keel to float off the mud. Due to tidal constraints, the barges were loaded by hand. Castle later built a wooden jetty further down the channel, leading to a small peninsula in the river. This then allowed the barges to load at high and low tides. Later, to improve the speed of loading, he built a narrow gauge, horse-drawn railway from the quarry to the new wooden jetty. Trucks on the railway had side tippers, so could just tip their loads into the barges. The chalk was then transported to Coimbra via seven barges owned by Alfred and his brother James. The works produced 400 tonnes of cement a week. In 1890, Joseph Wilders and Frannick Joseph Carey were searching for a coastal site of their own cement works. 
an agreement was made with Alfred Castle to use the eastern side of the peninsula. The new works required some land reclamation by constructing an extension to the existing causeway and extending the railway out to the works on the island. It was one of the smallest cement works on record. A wharf of timber and concrete was also built to enable barges to unload coke and clay. When the works were fully operational, Carey and Wilders employed a minimum of men who were on a shift system. It was a very bleak place to work, especially during the winter months. It gained the nickname Horrid Hill. The cement works closed in 1910, but chalk was still quarried and supplied the cement works in Queenborough for many years. The last vessel to berth there was a barge, the Dick Turpin, which subsequently ran aground in the estuary off Horrid Hill in 1913. Some of its cargo of Dundee marmalade jars can still be recovered in the River Medway. So that was a little look at the, the history of this uh, unique little peninsula that we've uh, wild camped on here at the Riverside Country Park in Kent. And yeah, goes to show you the amount of industry and stuff that was once on the, the River Medway in the estuary and continues to be as well. It's still you know, a busy river, busy estuary and stuff. Um, it's the end of this video. Hope you've enjoyed it get in the comments and let us know what you think and until next time take care of yourselves look after each other and get out there explore life's too short okay cheers everyone see you later bye